After a very long hiatus, I'm pleased to announce that I have finally made some progress on the world's fastest rook. Today, we're going to talk about the changes I've made and why I made them. Hopefully, you'll learn something about 3D printer design along the way. Let's get started. As you might remember, in the last video I designed custom laser cut motor mounts to let me run four motors on my Rook. In the latest revision, you've probably noticed I'm not using those parts, and I've gone back to just two motors. So why is that? In short, I think I jumped the gun a bit with those metal parts. Four motors is cool and all, don't get me wrong, but other factors like the max flow rate and part cooling are way more likely to be bottlenecks than the motion system. If need be, I can always try adding more motors to this design as well. Going back to printed parts is more about convenience. As far as I know, I'm the first person to build this gantry, and I need to make sure that everything is working well before I can commit to getting parts made out of metal. So what's so special about this gantry anyways? Well, this is the Rook 2020 Mark III by Chaz, the same guy who released an upgraded version of the Simple Core Legacy, as well as the proud owner of the first Bamboo P1S running clipper. He created an upgraded version of the Rook 2020 gantry that has a flipped belt path, similar to that of the Monolith gantry. This version has a lot of improvements over the stock belt path, and I think this gantry will be a great base to build from. As many of you know, I recently moved to a new province, and I've been working to set up a YouTube studio inside of this garage here. One thing I didn't have was a proper desk to actually build stuff on. That's why I was so excited when FlexiSpot reached out and offered to send me their E6 standing desk. The desk itself came in a large box and was super easy to set up and use thanks to the included instructions. They also hooked me up with a very nice bamboo tabletop, which looks way more professional than my old setup. The desk itself is also on casters, which makes moving it around by myself super easy. When you don't want to move it, you can lock them down and the desk isn't going anywhere. The E6 is a motorized standing desk, and you can easily adjust the height of the desk from 25 all the way up to 50 inches by using the control panel at the front. The desk is rated to lift up to 160 kilograms or 355 pounds, more than enough to support all the printers I own combined. I don't have a chair in the garage, so I'm always using it as a standing desk. Still though, the height adjustability is extremely useful when I'm filming. Let me show you. A lot of my videos use these close-up shots to highlight a certain part of a build, or just to give a more detailed look into individual components. Before, I'd need to lower my tripod in order to get shots like these, but now with the E6, I can just raise the desk up and keep my tripod where it is. This saves a ton of time during filming. I don't think I could ever go back to doing it the old way. Thanks so much to FlexiSpot for sending this out to me. If you'd like to buy your own E6 or any of the other desks from FlexiSpot, take a look at my link in the description below. Thank you. The first thing I want to do is swap from the old three-way corner brackets to blind joints. Blind joints are a sleek, low-profile way to assemble a frame out of aluminum extrusions. By tapping the ends of the extrusions and drilling access holes into the sides, you can create 90 degree joints just by using button head screws. You can buy Rook frame kits online which come with pre-drilled and pre-tapped extrusions, but I bought a set of taps and decided to do the work myself instead. I wouldn't exactly call the process fun, but using a drill made it go by pretty quickly. Fellow YouTuber Canrog Creations has a great guide on drilling and tapping extrusions for beginners that I definitely advise checking out if you want to try this yourself. He also shared this super handy jig for drilling the holes, which made my life so much easier. Just attach it to the end of the extrusion and drill. Perfect holes every single time. I'll put a link to that tool in the description below. With everything tapped, drilled, and ready to go, we can finally start assembling the new frame. Like always, my advice is to build the frame on the flattest surface you have available. For most people, this will probably be the kitchen countertop. There we go, that's the frame done. In future, I will probably want to make the frame even stiffer, so I'm looking at adding some metal corner brackets or maybe even structural metal panels. In the last video, I designed a custom Z-axis for the Rook, but I never had a chance to test it. Chaz's design also includes a custom triple Z-axis, but I decided to stick with my own setup just so I can see if it actually works or not. If it doesn't work, then I'll just swap to Chaz's triple Z instead. A big weak point of my Z is how tedious it is to assemble. To make my life easier, I printed out a bunch of spacers to align the rod mounts properly. These took the assembly process from painful to tolerable, so I'm gonna have to call that a success. Now, everything appears to move smoothly, but the only way to know for sure is to actually use it for a print. Fingers crossed. If my Z does end up working, I'll be sure to share all the files as an official Rook user mod so that other people can try it out as well. So far, everything I've done has been applicable to the stock Rook, but the gantry is quite a bit different. 
Rather than using the MGN9C rails that the stock Rook uses, Chaz opted for MGN9H rails for the Mark III gantry. For the Y rails, I'm using some generic AliExpress rails, and the X rail is a Yumi Tong rail with a Z2 preload. The preload of a linear rail can be thought of like the amount of play in the rail. The carriages on the Y rails are quite loose and fall easily under their own weight. On the X rail, the carriage needs quite a bit of a push to get it to move. Even though it takes more effort to move the carriage, the movement itself is still very, very smooth. Having a medium preload rail on X should help prevent the tool head from rocking back and forth, but that's only going to be the case if we have an extremely well-balanced tool head. I packed these linear rails with grease before installing them on the frame. I'm not planning on enclosing this printer, so I've gone with some regular old EP2 grease here. I'm using the Voron rail alignment tools to make sure that the rails are properly centered on the extrusions. Before we install the rest of the gantry, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. While PCBWay is known for their high quality PCB manufacturing, did you know they also offer professional 3D printing services? Whether you need SLA, SLS, FDM, or even SLM metal parts, PCBWay can make it happen. They are perfect for prototyping, functional parts, or even end-use products. If you want to build your own Rook but don't have a 3D printer at home, PCBWay could be exactly what you're looking for. With fast turnaround times and prices that won't break your budget, check out PCBWay's services using the link below and bring your next idea to life. Next up, we can install the front idlers. These attach to the frame via a number of M5x8 bolts and T-nuts. Ideally, I'd be using roll-in T-nuts for this build, but all I have on hand are the more common hammerhead ones. Some of these are going to be quite tricky to install. The Mark III gantry uses shoulder bolts for all of the idlers, which is a welcome change from the screws on the stock Rook gantry. Chaz specs a range of brass spacers to align the idlers, but I'm using printed spacers here instead. I just printed a whole plate of spacers at different heights and grabbed whichever ones I needed during the build. In general, the assembly would go something like this. Push the shoulder bolts through the printed part and stack all the spacers and idlers on the bolt, then install that whole assembly onto the printer. The XY joints are looking good, now let's move on to the belt tensioners. The tensioners for the front idlers need 20mm long, 5mm diameter pins for the idlers to ride on. I had some pins left over from the last gantry, but they were all too long. I sanded those down and then cut them to the right length. Not the cleanest job ever, but hey, they'll work. The next step is to install the motor mounts. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but the motor mounts would be the most painful part of the entire assembly. Right off the bat, I realized that the stock motor mounts didn't actually fit on the frame. The stock pieces are designed to index into the extrusion, but that slot was colliding with the vertical extrusions. I went into CAD and fixed that slot myself, but I also told Chaz about the issue and he fixed it in the official release as well. I printed out those new parts, and now we can install them onto the frame. That's when I noticed another issue. The stock motor mounts are composed of two parts. The bottom part, which we just fixed, and the top part, which houses the bearing for double shear support. Unfortunately, the tolerances on this part were a bit too loose to hold the F695 bearing, so I had to go through and change that as well. Again, Chaz has been notified of the issue and has fixed this for the official release. A quick reprint and we were back in business. Now we can install all the idlers on the shoulder bolts and put the two assemblies together. I'm intentionally leaving everything a bit loose here, and I'll tighten everything down properly after I install the motors. Speaking of motors, for this build I'm using LDO 2504s with 55mm long shafts. Unfortunately, this design does require long shaft motors in order to get proper double shear support. I got my motors from 3D Lab Tech here in Canada, but the OMC 2504s that I used on my Ender 3 might be easier to source depending on where in the world you live. I'll put a link to both in the description. Before installing the motors, I also added these extra screws in the back. Even with hammerhead T-nuts, this was really easy to do. As I tried to install the motors, I realized I had made a mistake. You need M3 by 40 mm screws to attach the motors, but the longest I had available was M3 by 35 mm. I went back to the original Rook 2020 Mark III CAD and added a counterbore to all of the screw holes here. That way I could use my M3 by 35 mm screws instead. Everything looked good and we could get back to installing it on the frame. Just gotta remember to add those F695s for double shear. Oh. So, looks like by mistake, I added the, the countersunk holes here to the old top plates, which are too loose for the double shear bearings, um, <laughs> which sucks. So we're on, let's see if I can get everything in frame here. We're on like our fourth revision of the top plates, second revision of the motor mounts, um, I'm sure this part of the video has been like two minutes max, but in real life, uh, it's been four days because 
I only have a handful of hours a day I can work on this, and every time something doesn't work and I have to reprint, that's usually it for the night. So yeah, four days of real life time, and we're still, we're still on the motor mounts here. Uh, you can hear some, some funny noises. Uh, I got the bamboo going. I, I gave up, that's my camera strap. I got the bamboo going. I, I, I've given up on preheating the Trident for an hour for every single one of these reprints. So we're just doing them out of PLA, but we're getting there. We're getting there. I fixed the tolerances and printed off what I sincerely hoped would be the final revision of the part. As the saying goes, fourth try is the charm. Finally, we had a part that worked and I could finish assembling the motor mounts. These look super good and they feel quite strong too. Let's get the tool head and the belts installed, and then we'll call it a day. Chaz made a custom carriage to support the new belt path. It attaches to the X-rail and secures the belts via clamps here on the sides. The carriage supports standard V0 tool heads. Triangle Labs graciously sent me a Dragon Ace hot end to use for this project, and I plan to use Ant Head for this build since it natively supported the Dragon Ace. I printed out all of the parts and installed all of the heat sets before realizing that I didn't have a 2510 fan. I could have sworn I brought both a 3010 and a 2510 up here with me, but it turns out I actually brought two 3010s. With Ant Head out of the question, I had to look for a new tool head. Chirpy's Rapid Burner doesn't officially support the Dragon Ace, but since the Ace is just 3mm shorter than a Dragon UHF, which it does support, it was pretty easy to modify. Okay, let's finish this. For the extruder, I'm going to use the Sherpa Mini with a special 6 tooth motor from LDO. This should give me plenty of power to max out the flow rate of the Dragon Ace. And that is looking good. Before we end, I want to talk a bit about electronics. I'm going to print a back panel that has standoffs to mount all of the electronics that we need. Since I don't have much available space on the frame, I'm going to try using a laptop power supply like this. Big Tree Tech generously sent me a Manta M8P for my upcoming Cappy video, but I think a board like that could be better utilized on a build like this. Big Tree Tech also sent out four of their TMC5160 Pro stepper drivers, which will unlock higher run currents and even the possibility of 48 volts in the future. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. If you have any suggestions for things I should install next, please let me know. In the next video, I'll set up the electronics and firmware, and finally do an actual print to get a baseline for quality. Thanks for bearing with me, I know it's been a long one.